evening and welcome to the University of Toronto's Mississauga's webinar entitled Canada's Homelessness Crisis. My name is Ziad Vahid and I'm proud U of T alumni. I also have the great privilege on serving, uh, I've had the great privilege on serving on UTM's alumni board and currently serve on the UTM's campus council. I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Although this event takes place online, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, as being the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, we have alumni and friends from all over the world watching this event, as well as from across Canada and the United States. Welcome to everyone attending around the world. Following this presentation, there will be a moderated question and answer period, and we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're having technical difficulties, please use the chat button, and one of our staff will be there to assist you through a private message. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our presenter. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, Allison Smith. Allison teaches core classes on Canadian politics, federalism, complex policymaking, and housing policy here at UTM. Her recent book, Multiple Barriers, The Multi-Level Governance of Homelessness in Canada, was awarded the Seymour Martin Lipset Best Book Award. And in it, she asked why four of the biggest cities in Canada have developed such different governance and policy responses to homelessness. Her current research builds on this book, expanding the analysis to study homelessness, governance, and policy responses in small, mid-sized, and northern communities in Canada. Allison also has a research partnership in collaboration with the Old Brewery Mission in Montreal to understand the role rent banks can play in efforts to prevent homelessness. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Allison. Without further ado, I'll let you get started. Thank you very much, Ziad. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Just make sure that I think everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Ziad, for that uh, introduction. I'd also, um, I'd like to acknowledge I'm joining you today from Victoria. I'm spending my sabbatical uh, out, out west at home in Victoria, the traditional territory of the Kwangan peoples, known today as the Esquimalt and the Songhees. So thank you so much to everyone for being here today. Thank you to Ben so much for organizing this and Melissa and Ziad for being here and to, uh, to helping with the presentation today. I'm really happy to have a chance to talk to you uh, about some of my research about the homelessness and housing crisis in Canada. Um, oh, I'm... Do I change? There we go. Uh, you may, I mean, it, it will not be news to anyone that we are in a housing crisis right now. Of course, the housing crisis right now is affecting people across the income spectrum, across the housing spectrum, uh, including moderate income renters, first time home buyers. Um, but there has been a crisis of affordable and adequate housing for people with low incomes in Canada for well over a decade. This crisis right now is deeper and it's wider than it has been historically but there has long been a crisis of adequate housing for people with low incomes, the most severe manifestation of which uh, is homelessness. Homelessness is sometimes said to be a new problem of public policy and chronic homelessness is, but it's not just the result of the pandemic. This is a picture that was taken in First United, an emergency shelter that I volunteered at when I was doing my master's degree at UBC. This picture was taken by Jay Black, a freelance photographer, and really shows back in 2008 that there really was a homelessness crisis in um, the downtown east side, certainly, and in different communities across the country as well at that time. But over the course of the pandemic, we saw it really reach new levels. This is a picture of Topaz Park in Victoria, just a, a show of a tremendous amount of unmet housing need um, in this community. And I think there were, there were communities across the country that uh, had similar, maybe not quite as large, or maybe even larger tent cities emerge. Uh, this was in some ways related to the pandemic, to the COVID-19 pandemic, during the sort of early days of the pandemic when we were trying to socially distance and make sure that everyone had space 
emergency shelters reduced their capacity uh, to try to enforce distancing and to keep the people staying there safe. So there were fewer people who were able to access emergency shelters, meaning that people had to go outside. But really this unmet housing need pre-existed. It, it existed before the pandemic. And what the pandemic really did was sort of put it out into full view in public parks um, and public spaces, really exposing what a lot of advocates already knew, which was that there were tens of thousands of people without adequate housing um, and many people accessing the emergency system every year. So I think that especially this day and age, I think that we know that this um, that the continued existence of homelessness is certainly not free. It's actually really expensive. People in Toronto will probably remember the very dramatic and somewhat violent clearings of encampments in 2021 uh, in Trinity Bellwoods, Alexandra Park and Lamport Stadium. There's currently uh, a big crisis in Edmonton where there's encampment clearing, clearings uh, in the midst of ongoing court battles about whether or not that's even the, the city can even do that. Um, subsequent reporting on this found that the city spent almost $2 million to clear uh, those encampments. Um, homeless encampments as they kind of currently exist aren't really a long-term solution, but it is known activists all across the spectrum from moderate activists to kind of more radical activists really insist that dismantling encampments, displacing people actually puts them into greater housing insecurity. And so there's kind of a case to be made here for not only is homelessness costing a lot of money to manage, but in some cases we're actually kind of spending a lot of money to even make it worse in the short term for some people. In addition to the economic cost, of course, there's a social cost. So uh, it's known that people who are underhoused or unhoused living on the streets have lower life expectancy than people who are housed. Again, during the early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about this, about the fact that people who are underhoused or unhoused live with a lot of pre-existing conditions, underlying conditions that put them really at great risk of a devastating outcome were they to catch COVID. So there is an economic cost, but there really also is a social cost um, that is experienced. People die in Toronto. There's the homeless memorial that tracks the number of people who die while experiencing homelessness every year, and that just continues to grow and grow. So in terms of solutions to the housing crisis, if anything, as I said, it's only gotten worse. Of course, there's um, a really strong case to be made for increased funding and for systems reform, especially, but not just for housing. Um, housing is a very expensive type of infrastructure, especially government owned or non-market housing is very expensive in the short term. Um, but in the long term, especially considering sort of those encampment clearances and the social costs, housing is a really good investment. So increasing investments and also reforming systems that are contributing to the continued existence of homelessness is a really important part of the solution. But from my perspective, um, I tend to look at this question more from the perspective of governance. Governance being who is it that's developing solutions to the homelessness crisis, who is not, are they working together? Is the expertise that exists being really incorporated into policy? Um, so that's how I consider, that's what I would consider to be governance. There's a lot of literature that has shown that governance really matters to the quality of social policy that's produced, specifically even inclu including homelessness. So Carrie Doberstein's book in Canada, Charlie Willison's book in the United States, and Ninka Bosveld's book in Europe have all found that governance the mix of who is doing what and with whom really matters to the quality of social policy that is developed and matters in terms of um, responses to homelessness. So inclusive networks that bring together diverse voices, a whole bunch of stakeholders who are involved in homelessness and also that are somehow institutionalized, that there's rules and there's norms and there's a regular opportunity for those groups to get together and talk. Um, those are the dynamics, the governance dynamics that lead to effective policy development. And there's been work show, that has shown that governance dynamics matter for other social policies as well, um, including healthcare. One of the reasons why healthcare has remained universal is because of the governance dynamic that characterizes it. Federal and provincial governments have to agree on changes to it, and that has actually insulated the healthcare system from attacks and from cuts. So my book uh, that was that came out last year, Multiple Barriers, um, asks what shapes those governance dynamics in the first place. So we know 
that there are particular types of governance dynamics, inclusive governance networks, institutionalized governance networks that lead to more innovative and effective policies. So why don't we see that in communities across Canada? So in my book, I asked why that's the case, looking at Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Montreal. And so that's kind of the perspective, that governance perspective that I want to spend most of today talking about. So that's kind of a long-winded introduction to the outline of the presentation today, which will start with a very brief history of homelessness in Canada. And then we'll talk a little bit more about who governs this area of policy and who should govern, an equally important question. We'll then take a quick look at what is working in Canada and also what could work better in Canada and what is working well internationally. And there's a couple of examples, if I have time to talk about both of them, Finland and Wales. In terms of the history of, um, of homelessness in Canada, uh, as I said, chronic homelessness, the type of homelessness that we see in communities across the country now is relatively new. Yet there has always been a need for emergency shelter for people who don't have shelter of their own. So this is a picture of the old brewery mission. At this point, it's probably 135 years ago now. This picture itself is a little bit dated. But this, um, this shelter opened uh, well over 100 years ago to provide emergency shelter for people who didn't have shelter on their, on their own. As you can see, there's a long lineup of people outside. Um, importantly, most of the people in this situation were men of working age who, for whatever reason, weren't able to work. So there was always, there always has been a role for an emergency shelter type um, uh, support in the welfare state. And arguably there all, always will be, even if we were to move towards ending homelessness, there really always would be need for that type of emergency system. And yet there have been changes since this period of time, especially in the 1990s and early 2000s, there were a lot of changes. More people began to experience homelessness, but also a different and growingly kind of diverse demographic of people began to experience homelessness. To put it most bluntly, um, In From the Cold is an emergency shelter that operates in communities across the country. Here is a recent list of um, items that they're requesting for donations. And so particularly striking would be pants for toddlers, hoodies for toddlers, diapers, pull-ups, car seats, strollers, a bathtub for babies. Um, this is new. This hasn't always happened. Of course, there have always been children and always been babies living in poverty. The Canadian welfare state is known as a liberal welfare state. That means that the welfare state has few universal programs. The social policies that do exist are very, very specifically targeted. And a kind of characteristic of liberal welfare states is actually a very high tolerance for child poverty. Um, countries like Canada, the US, the UK, um, it seems to be relatively normal for there to be what in other countries would be intolerable in terms of child poverty. And yet it has not always been the case that there have that the poverty has been so deep that kids and babies are living in emergency shelters. So that is a really important change. And it's important to understand where that came from in order to understand who's responsible for developing solutions to, the, to that. Um, one of the uh, a very sort of important and prominent influential advocate in Toronto, Michael Shapcott, talked about seeing this transformation happen before his eyes in the 1990s, seeing this increasingly large kind of demographic of people experiencing homelessness. He told me in, in an interview for my book, and he gave me permission to quote him, uh, he said, I was a good advocate. I was out on evenings and weekends. I never, ever, ever, ever saw children homeless. I never saw seniors homeless. Nowadays, people don't seem to be too shocked that children, pregnant women, and seniors are homeless. But it certainly was very shocking for us in the 1990s, a clear sign that something was happening. There was something going on in the housing system causing this catastrophic failure, and more and more people were out there. So how did we get here? So there's a lot of blame to go all around, and I will take a little bit of time to sort of share that blame through different levels of government. But of course, we'll start with federal and provincial governments uh, and cuts that were made, especially to housing, to government um, investment in social housing, and also to social assistance. But first, just in terms of a brief history lesson on, on housing, um, homelessness is a lot of things. There's different ways of defining homelessness. It's important to recognize it doesn't always mean the same thing to everyone. And yet homelessness is always a lack of housing. 
And so looking back at the history of the housing system is an important uh, way of kind of understanding where these changes came from. So the, the 1960s, but really 1970s was known as the most successful era of Canadian housing policy. The model of housing that was developed at that time involved a lot of investment from the federal government, also a lot of partnership and investment from provincial governments um, and partnerships with nonprofits and with co-ops. So this is Willow Park, um, the first housing co-op. It was developed in Winnipeg in 1961. Uh, a co-op model of housing um, is a bit different from nonprofit housing, but they share some of their primary motivations, which is to be sort of smaller developments of housing, not stigmatizing, not necessarily identifiable as non-market or social housing, really had a strong role for nonprofits in the management, in the day-to-day -day operations, as opposed to government operated, government managed. And these were also really um, mixed communities. It was not just targeted housing at people with very low incomes or people at risk of homelessness, but low income and uh, moderate income families as well. The Some people I saw in the questions before were asking for additional resources to learn a little bit more about housing and homelessness. For housing policy, this is the, this is the text to read, um, the History of Canadian Social Housing Policy by Greg Sutter. So Greg Sutter calls the nonprofit and co-op model of the 1970s, the quintessential success story in Canadian housing policy. And he notes that during that era, 50% of low income housing need was met through the social housing system. So that's obviously not all of the housing need. There was also a boom in rental construction during that period, but 50% of low income housing need was met through social housing. Today, when we look at the wait list for social housing, just in Toronto alone, it's over 85,000 households on the wait list for social housing. So we've come a long way. And the most consequential uh, pivot point was in, if you can't tell from the uh, finance minister, Paul Martin, you may be able to see through the hair and the glasses that this was the 1990s. This was a very important budget in the 1990s where we saw the federal government essentially withdraw from social housing and really make important cuts in social policy. So there's two important decisions that were made during this period. First, as I said, historically, the federal government was the leading, leading funder of non-market housing. In the early 1990s, they said no more. The funding from the federal government collapsed down to zero and stayed there for a very long time. The federal government completely drew back investments in social housing. But second had to do with broader financing of the welfare state. So in the Canadian Federation, there are a number of fiscal imbalances. So that means that there are inequalities and inequities in terms of how resources are distributed. And there's ways of trying to equalize those. So we have horizontal inequalities where some provinces have greater revenue capacity than others. And so through the equalization formula, the federal government decides the equalization formula. That's a unilateral federal responsibility. But the federal government determines how it's going to assess provincial revenues and then redistributes funding to provinces. Importantly, that is conditionless. There are no conditions on that funding. Provinces can spend it however they want. There are also transfers uh, to address what's called the vertical fiscal imbalance, the imbalance between the federal government and provinces. The federal government has more money than it needs to implement its powers, and provinces do not have the revenue capacity to really fulfill all of their responsibilities. So provinces depend on the federal government to transfer them financial support in order to implement their, their policies. The big political obvious example of this is healthcare. Healthcare is provincial responsibility. Provinces can't fund it alone, so they have to wait on federal transfers. You're in this budget in the 1990s, the federal government also unilaterally changed the system of transfers to the provinces which, long story short, resulted in provinces getting a lot less money to implement their own social policies. So this was a period of austerity, and the welfare state was really kind of the main target or one of the targets for those austerity measures. Faced with um, no federal partner in the housing policy system and less money to spend on social policies, uh, because of all of these various imbalances and the way the federal government went about making changes, 
Um, most provinces, eight out of 10 provinces, cut their own spending in social housing. BC and Quebec were the only two provinces that continued to rely exclusively on provincial funding to continue to invest in social housing. Ontario took things a step further, and I think this is important to understand for Ontarians in Ontario, but also looking elsewhere, is that Ontario is the only province in the Federation that transferred that responsibility even further to the local level. This was um, under Mike Harris's common sense revolution, um, specifically the local services realignment process that he went through, which in and of itself is a good thing. He was asking, it was the who does what, who is responsible for what in the province of um, Ontario. And there was a realignment in terms of who was doing what. Uh, local governments previously were responsible for education that was uploaded to the province and provinces downloaded housing policy to the local level. Um, that was resisted by local governments, but they could do very little. Um, uh, local governments in the Canadian Federation are creatures of the provinces. Provinces have huge power over municipalities. But so Ontario is the only province where local governments have been given that responsibility. There was not an additional transfer of funding to fulfill that responsibility, um, which is particularly problematic in Ontario because in the 1960s, uh, the PC government was actually the leader in social housing um, development in the country. Most of the social housing that was developed during that period was actually in Ontario. So current, so municipalities are currently suffering from this withdrawal of leadership from the early leadership and now to nothing that there is a lot of social housing but it's old it needs a lot of repairs um, and municipalities are not in a place to be able to invest in those repairs also not in a place to be able to ex invest in expanding that system so in ontario there's a particular mismatch where we have the authority for housing at the local level but the resources to be able to invest in an inclusive and sustainable housing system are at the provincial and federal level. So when there isn't alignment, it can be very difficult um, to, to sort of make improvements to the housing system. Again, Ontario wasn't the only province to cut social housing. Um, all other provinces except BC and Quebec did as well. But it remains to be said that even today, when we look back on what would be the solution to the housing crisis anyways, it's a return to the 1970s when there was senior government investment in the system and collaboration with nonprofit and uh, co-op developments. Of course, local governments have a role to play here too in terms of the housing crisis itself and the sort of way that that housing crisis has contributed to homelessness. Uh, the local the, the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force has identified supply constraints that have caused problems throughout Ontario in particular. A lot of um, Ontario, a lot of Toronto is zoned for single family homes and that has limited even gentle density, um, secondary suites, laneway houses, garden suites, or even duplexes. There's not a lot of land that's zoned for that type of housing or there hasn't been historically. And so there's an argument to be made that there are there is a housing crisis in the sort of more middle part of the housing spectrum that has been um, that local governments have contributed to. It gets interesting here because I think local governments have really limited tools, especially when it comes to more affordable types of housing. And but you can see that there's disagreement in terms of who is responsible. And this is one of the big challenges when it comes to housing and homelessness in Canada is the division of responsibility and the difficulty in terms of holding uh, a government to account. So if I can give you um, an example here outside of Ontario from 2015 in BC, I don't usually like to put this many words on my slide, but I'll just point to the important parts. So Gregor Robertson was mayor of Vancouver. He sent this letter in 2015 to then premier of BC, Christy Clark. Gregor Robertson was elected in 2008 on a promise to end street homelessness. By 2015, it was pretty clear that that was not going to happen, but he was still trying to increase the supply of affordable housing, especially for lower and middle income people living in Vancouver, and he knew he needed collaboration. So he sent a letter to Christy Clark and also to uh, Bill Morneau, who was then finance minister at the federal level, asking for collaboration. 
As he writes on this second page here, he says the single biggest step the province could do or take, but do um, to address the soaring housing costs in Metro Vancouver is to generate thousands of new housing units that are affordable for lower and middle income taxpayers. And so he comes up with a couple of ideas, including increasing provincial investments in social housing, stronger partnership and support with nonprofit and co-op co housing operators. And then at the bottom here, he says, call me anytime to discuss. This is really a priority. And he's really eager to collaborate with the province. So a couple of weeks later in June, he gets a response from Christy Clark, um, a shorter response, thanking him for getting in touch. Uh, but she's really showing here that she sees this very differently and that she actually sees a very limited role for the province in addressing the housing crisis and especially for lower income households and as it may relate to homelessness as well. Particularly um, striking is on the second page where she writes, um, she comes up with a bunch of responses to Robertson basically saying no over and over. Um, and then she says, finally, beyond any new taxes to curb demand, there is also the option of increasing supply through better land use planning. So that really is slamming the door um, in his face, quite clearly saying to the extent that there's a housing crisis in Vancouver, it's the result of local zoning decisions. Uh, the disagreement over whose responsibility is, is um, toxic and it really gets in the way of developing solutions. The reality is she did have a point, but so did Gregor Robertson and they needed to find a way to work together. And the fact that they couldn't was really uh, problematic for the development of policy solutions. Uh, in terms, again, of where this problem came from, there's been a lot that's been written about deinstitutionalization um, and the, the process in the 1980s and 1990s that mental health institutions were shut down um, for, albeit for good reasons, for rights-based reasons, to allow for people to live more independently and in communities, but the supports that would have allowed them to do so, that would have allowed them to thrive in that environment, never followed. And so a lot of those people ended up in emergency shelters. Uh, some scholars have noted even that emergency shelters became de facto mental health institutions. So this is something that, especially during that period, has been documented. But um, the powerhouse scholar from U of T, David Holchansky, also he pushes back on this idea that mental health is a cause of homelessness. He writes, not all people with mental illness are homeless and not all people who are homeless report, report a mental illness. He also insists that the arrow points both ways, that mental illness may in some cases be a cause of homelessness, but homelessness in housing security is also actually quite um, understandably a cause of mental illness as well. Peter Menzies, who worked at CAMH for a long time, especially working in indigenous health, also challenged the idea of mental illness at the individual level. He said, rather than pathologizing the individual, I would argue that mental illness should be reviewed as resulting from a historical process. And for him, that historical process is colonialism, historic and ongoing, and the intergenerational trauma that um, results from it. Um, I interviewed Murray Sinclair for my book. He also gave me permission to um, to quote him, and he talks. He talked very directly about uh, the overrepresentation of Indigenous people among the homeless population as being a very intentionally created a forced problem. So he said the reality for the Indigenous population of, in Canada is that the government of Canada, at all levels, federal and provincial particularly, worked very hard for many generations to render Indigenous peoples landless. The result was that Indigenous peoples were forced to move from place to place, forced to relocate or had their rights, their entitlement to stay in a particular place taken away from them or interfered with. There's no question that the impoverishment of Indigenous peoples was a forced impoverishment. This was created impoverishment by the government of Canada. Also for those asking for additional resources, Lua Native Housing Society in Vancouver has produced a series of videos home with nowhere to live that really gets into the history and the ongoing realities of, um, of the overrepresentation of indigenous peoples among the homeless population and the way that colonialism plays into that. So we have a series of policy decisions, decisions to cut investments in social housing, decisions to limit zoning, 
decision, decisions to not support people living in community. But we also have uh, what we call in political science indecisions as well. So this is creates a process called policy drift. So this happens when policy fails to adapt to changing realities in society. Um, and that's where the indecision comes from. It's a it's a, a failure to do something. So there's a lot of different examples. There's a lot of attention right now to uh, to immigration, to the way the population has grown and housing maybe hasn't kept up. There's a lot of other ways that the population has changed as well that are very relevant. The rise in single parent households, the increasing number of people uh, of of the working poor, for example, um, and policy has not responded to those social risks and the demographics of the country. So in the 1970s, um, social housing wasn't meeting 100% of low income housing need, but it was meeting that need pretty closely. We had 50% of low income housing need being met through social housing. So we have social risk being matched fairly closely with social policy. But then the policy changed on the one hand, moving further and further away. We had the cuts to social housing, cuts to social assistance, all of this. But then we also had on the other side, changes in the country, changes in the demographics, a growing population, a changing profile of poverty. So we have uh, policy and, and policy problem drifting further and further apart, creating a bigger and bigger gap in terms of what policy is and more importantly is not doing. And so, the result of all of this and many more things I haven't been able to get into, but sort of those are the big structural pieces, is um, an increase in homelessness. So with that history, um, I think it's uh, what I'm trying to, I'm trying to make the case in terms of who governs is that everyone should govern, but it is actually very difficult to get to hold any level of government to account. Everyone has a responsibility, so everyone is in some way dependent on another level of government. Christy Clark had a responsibility, but she was pointing to the local level. The local level was pointing to the provincial and the federal level. It's really hard in a complex area of policy to create policy in this type of fragmented space. Federal, provincial, regional, municipal governments all have a role. Indigenous-led organizations and nonprofit organizations also have expertise and capacity to develop appropriate um, solutions that allow people to live in a safe space to heal, to, um, to, to live in a place that is, that is affordable to them and, and adequate, uh, culturally responsive. And the private sector also has a role to play in terms of, especially in terms of the changes, but in terms of developing solutions as well. When it comes to who should govern, I mean, it's everyone. Everyone needs to be together. Everybody does need to be working together, going in the same direction, collaborating, if not collaborating, at least moving in the same direction. We talk a lot in Canada about jurisdiction, about the constitutional division of powers, um, and that is a very important structure and institutional feature of the country. Um, and yet when it comes to, especially as we walk through this history of, of housing and homelessness, when we think more in terms of responsibility, whose responsibility is it? It's everyone's responsibility. And so everyone needs to be bringing what they can, whether that's resources or expertise or capacity or land or whatever to the solutions. In terms of what is working, so um, this is David Eby, he's the current premier um, of BC. BC's housing crisis has been ongoing for a very long time. It is certainly, I'm certainly not here to say that he's solved the housing crisis, but just to show a few uh, examples of interventions that an innovative province and an interventionist province um, is making in the housing system. So David Eby very much comes from an activist background. I don't think we've seen a lot of premiers like him. He's a lawyer, um, but has worked a lot in civil liberties. He worked for Pivot Legal Society, which has done a lot of important advocacy work, um, especially in the downtown east side. Uh, and housing is one of his, the homelessness crisis and housing crisis is one of his main priorities. So there's a couple of strategies that have been developed here that see the province really taking an aggressive um, leadership role, making a lot of investments and intervening in terms of structural, systemic and more individual level solutions. In terms of structural, the province has created um, a rental protection fund. This has been um, a move to make $500 million available for nonprofits um, and other community-based groups uh, 
uh, co-ops as well to purchase market housing and effectively take it out of the market and put it into the non-market side of things. So this would be increasing the non-market supply of housing. Canada has comparatively, even when compared with the United States, a very small share of our overall housing market is non-market housing. The rest of the market is kind of a, you know, a free for all where we can see increasing rents going up like crazy, especially right now. Once housing is in the non-market sector, that housing is protected from those increases. It doesn't become about profit, it becomes more about affordability. So the province made this announcement and then the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, BC Nonprofit Housing Society and the Co-op Society of BC said, thank you very much. We will be in charge of this money. Uh, and the province actually did agree to transfer the money over to these three organizations to manage. They have a conflict of interest process in place because many of their organization members will be applying for it. But this is kind of a community controlled pot of money that is designed to increase non-market housing supply, which is one of the important structural interventions to be made to protect that housing for people with low incomes and for people who are at risk of homelessness or maybe exiting, uh, looking to exit homelessness. In terms of systemic changes, of course, this is still inadequate, but in BC, people who receive social assistance, like in Ontario, receive a shelter allowance portion of social assistance. So that's money that can go towards shelter costs. Um, from 2007 to 2022, that amount was $375 per month for someone receiving social assistance could pay towards shelter costs. Even in 2007, it would have been very hard to find somewhere safe and adequate for that amount of money. Certainly in 2022, uh, it's nearly impossible to find something that really meets someone's housing needs. So in 2023, as more of a systemic um, change to the how, to the shelter, uh, income security system, that amount was increased to $500 a month. That is still wholly inadequate in terms of um, what type of housing you can find, but that is a huge jump, a jump up by a third in terms of the, uh, the funding that's available to people to access um, housing per month. In Ontario, uh, someone receiving Ontario Works, their shelter allowance is $390 a month, for someone on disability, it's a little bit higher, $556 a month, still a really inadequate amount um, of money. At the more individual level, there are uh, rent banks, and I have a project on rent banks right now. Uh, so rent banks are um, an emergency intervention that's available to a household that is at risk of eviction for a financial reason. So that's a household that may uh, experience a financial emergency one month and be unable to pay rent uh, or may have fallen into rental arrears and is at risk of an eviction. BC rent banks offer an alternative to predatory loans. They're either no interest loans or grants, money that goes to a landlord to really void an eviction and ensure the housing stability of that household. Especially in this market when rents are increasing dramatically every month, uh, this intervention is a really important one, especially if a household has been in their home for three years, five years, 10 years, it's unlikely that they'll be able to find a place to live for a comparable amount of money. Vacancy decontrol means that between tenants, uh, rents can increase really quickly. And that's one of the reasons why rents have risen so dramatically in the past few years. So keeping households in their housing is a really important intervention um, to maintain their housing security. Research has shown that eviction, whether it's from an encampment or from a home, tends to lead to a downward spiral of housing instability that people either end up paying much more in rent or living in a lower quality of housing. There are rent banks um, throughout Ontario, uh, but in BC it's province-wide, a household in any part of the province can access um, a rent bank. In terms of what we could be doing better, so the federal government um, is always an easy target here to, to sort of pick on a little bit. Uh, there is a national housing strategy that's great news, and I applaud the federal government for doing that. That's the single most important federal intervention in housing policy since the 1980s. Um, it is very much geared to home ownership of the billions, the tens of billions of dollars. You have to really look carefully at what that money is. Over half of that amount of money is a loan. It's not a full-on investment into housing. 
So I think there's some improvements in terms of what the federal government can do. Um, Mayor Nahid Nenshi talked about the federal government, the role the federal government can play. Uh, and I heard him say this at a conference, but he would always kind of say, if the federal government disappeared tomorrow, it would probably take Canadians a few weeks to notice, perhaps a few hours or even days in the case of a provincial government. Of course, and then his kind of punchline was that, but if municipalities disappeared, he says we wouldn't notice because everyone would be dead. That's his kind of <laughs> conclusion. But he says, because municipalities do all the stuff that keeps communities safe, whether that's water, whether that's roads, whether that's land servicing, whether that's um, pot potable water, all of these different things. But the pushback that he gets to this, that no one would notice if the federal government were to disappear, is that the federal government does play a very important role, and that is to move money around. And this is what I talked about when talking about those, the fiscal and the vertical imbalance. The federal government moves money to either provinces that don't have the resources to develop social policies that are of comparable quality to other provinces or moves money down to the provinces. So this is an important role that the federal government can play and can continue to play. And so I see there's, a, there's an opportunity and there's advocacy, a lot of advocacy around the federal government doing similar, a similar program to what BC is doing, but with the financial resources of the federal government to create a pot of money, a federal acquisition fund that would allow local nonprofits or co-ops to buy up units such as this, a multifamily apartment building for sale, take that into the non-market and protect it as affordable housing in perpetuity. Another role the federal government can play is to really look long-term. And I do think a good example of this was the way that the federal government negotiated the most recent healthcare transfer with, uh, with the provinces. So the provinces were not happy ultimately with the amount of money that the federal government transferred to them. Provinces said they need a lot more money. Um, it's not my expertise to sort of weigh in on who was right and who was wrong, other than to note that, you know, there is a crisis in emergency rooms across the, the country, and there is some degree of funding that's, um, that is at play there. But what the federal government did do was said, here's your health transfer, uh, if you want more, you can have more money, but you have to spend it on family medicine. You have to spend it on um, a, a type of intervention in the healthcare system that is longer term. It's not as necessarily as immediate, but if you want more money, you can apply to us and tell us that you're going to spend it on family medicine. And this is actually a long-term way of taking pressure off of the emergency system. I have a friend who is um, who gave an example of why this is so important. Um, her husband is disabled and is on a very a high dose of a pain medicine, uh, such a high dose that it need it requires kind of a lot of knowledge of his medical history. He lost his family doctor, and so had to find a doctor that was able to prescribe him what he needed. Uh, but the doctor didn't know his medical history, didn't know him, ended up over prescribing him by five times and he was in the emergency room or he was in the hospital in a coma for nearly a week. You think about you think about the difference that a 10 or 15 minute appointment with a family doctor would have made versus the pressure that that's putting on the hospital system. With that additional layer of resources, with a lot of resources, the federal government does have an ability to look a little bit longer term and do these types of things where it can identify some of those bigger interventions that maybe on the front lines emergency workers aren't able to do, but work in collaboration to slowly start to turn the ship. I am running low on time, so I'll just talk briefly about the Housing Wales Act, uh, which was introduced in 2014. So this is um, very different than the, the approach in Canada in a number of ways. There's a duty to assist uh, that has been introduced in legislation in Wales that really prioritizes the prevention of homelessness, but that puts a duty on governments. In Wales, it is the local government. There is a duty to assist people who are threatened with homelessness, uh, to assist, help them in securing, to prevent the homelessness, to secure homelessness, to secure um, housing. So this is an actual requirement that can be enforced through legislation and through the courts that when people are even starting at to be at risk of homelessness, there are uh, avenues in place for local governments that have to kind of kick in 
to start to respond through through sort of meaningful ways. This is very different from the ways that rights work in Canada. We have negative rights in Canada, which means the government cannot interfere with your right. Whereas in Wales, it is a positive right. It's incredible. There is a there is a duty on the part of local governments to prevent homelessness. And certainly once someone is homelessness, there's a responsibility that is clearly defined at the local level. And this follows, um, this intervenes, this kind of follows a, a five part typology of homelessness I won't get into, but there's an emphasis on universal prevention. Um, and that sort of speaks to that initial point of contact with households at risk of eviction. There's every household is, um, is in some way able to rely on the local government to support them with, uh, with interventions to prevent their experiencing homelessness. Um, okay, I'll, we'll skip Finland. In terms of, as I wrap up, I thought I would just mention one quick uh, red flag here in terms of if you see or if you hear people saying it's really not that complicated or expensive or different, difficult to solve homelessness or to solve housing. On the one hand, it's not, it should be. We know that people need homes, people deserve homes, people have a right to homes, but it is very complicated. It is very expensive. It is very difficult. I was at the BC Nonprofit Housing Association Conference in Vancouver um, in November, and I took this picture. This is notable for a couple of reasons. First, I was in an overflow room. It was so crowded that there wasn't room for everyone in the main hall to listen to the keynote. But second is this, um, the fact that the Minister of Housing, Ravi Kalan, who was invited to give a keynote, was interrupted by activists who were protesting his government's response, especially to encampments. The province of BC does also have a response to encampments that involves essentially uh, breaking them up, trying to get people out of encampments um, into other types of housing, but those other types of housing are very limited. Um, and so this is, as I mentioned, this is the most interventionist province in the country and also even historically, and even still, it is so political and the consequences of doing it wrong or the consequences of not being sort of seen to be doing it right um, are really are really severe. Um, ultimately, I think this protest kind of backfired a little bit, um, but I think it makes clear the fact that those who are engaged in this work are dealing with um, differences of opinion, uh, very strong differences of opinion, and in a lot of cases, very legitimately different ways of looking at something. Um, and it is a really complicated thing. It takes a lot of uh, conversation. Um, and so I think that uh, that is something to just keep in mind, that this is, uh, this is a crisis that is not easy to solve. It requires a lot of collaboration. Um, and if you hear that it's, that it's easy, you may want to kind of, you may want to ask a few questions. So thank you very, very much for uh, for coming to this talk. I look forward to uh, the opportunity to talk with you a little bit hereafter. Thank you. Great, thank you, Allison, for uh, such a wonderful in-depth presentation. We are going to go to quick questions and answers now, and you can submit questions through the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but that being said, people did submit submit questions uh, ahead of time. Uh, before the presentation, so we'll start with some of those. Uh, one of the questions that uh, comes up and, and um, I think is one that many, many people might ask is, what is the difference between affordable and social housing? And what are the most promising housing-based solutions for people who are experiencing homelessness? Yeah, thanks. So that's a, there is a very important difference in terms of affordable housing and social housing. So social housing is, uh, refers to government funded, government-owned, government-operated housing. Um, we do have a lot of social housing in Canada built, again, during the 60s and 70s. It's kind of, it's comparable to nonprofit housing in that it is non-market housing. Non-profit uh, non housing is oftentimes government-funded, but managed by nonprofits, managed and operated by nonprofits. Whereas affordable housing, um, if you, you know, if ever you're hearing your local politician or in debates talking about affordable housing, it's really important to ask what it is that they mean by affordable housing, because it essentially it can mean anything that's below market rent. Um, it can mean maybe 80 or 90% of market rent uh, and maybe only for a few years. So that was during the early 2000s, there, was, there were these you know, investment in affordable housing frameworks. 
that the federal government partnered with provinces and the private sector on. There was a capital contribution to reduce the cost of initial upfront capital costs in exchange for some of those units being affordable for 20 or 25 years, but affordability was left up to the provinces. So Ontario defined that as 80% of market rent, which is unaffordable to um, a lot of people, especially people receiving social assistance. Um, and ultimately it is in the private market. So it is subject to rent increases every year. Um, and those units that are only affordable for 20, 25 years, after that period of time, they go right up to market rate. Um, whereas social or nonprofit is in perpetuity kept affordable. Great, thank you for that answer. The, the next question that we had was, in addition to limited housing supply, what other constraints are limiting an equitable and sustainable solution to homelessness in Canada? Uh, yeah, so there, so of course, housing is a very important one, a lack of affordable housing. Um, but there is, there's, I mean, there's, there are a lot of other dimensions to it. I think something that is coming up a lot right now is just the, the capacity in the um, nonprofit sector to manage, but also to provide the supports to people who, uh, especially to people who are needing more types of supportive housing, who need um, either supports permanently uh, in the housing or supports coming to see them to make sure that they have what they need in order to stay safe and to stay, stay securely housed. Um, at all of the conferences, everyone who I've been talking to is noting that recruiting people who can do that work and retaining people who can do that work is really, really hard. Um, a lot of times people who are doing that kind of frontline housing support work or social support work, oftentimes they themselves are living uh, on very low incomes um, and may not be living in a sustainable housing situation themselves. So this is, I think, um, a challenge even when, like I sometimes think about during the height of the pandemic when the uh, the province was opening up more ICU beds and opening up sort of tents of ICU beds in parking lots and all the ICU doctors and nurses were saying, well, you, uh, it's not the bed, it's the people who provide the services that we need. Um, I mean, with housing, it's both. It's the, the safe place to live, but for people who um, may struggle to live independently, may need, to, may need some additional supports, just the, 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 the people who are trained and who are able to do that type of work long term, uh, it can be really hard to find those people as well right now. Another question that has come in is, is what is the right to housing in Canada? And what difference would it make for people who are unhoused? Uh, what barriers are, are there to implementing the right to housing and other rights-based approaches to homelessness? Right, so the right to housing um, in Canada, I was, um, as I was saying towards the end that our rights in Canada, even those you know, enshrined in the constitution are negative rights, they're not positive rights. So that means that whether it's access, for example, to language, uh, to education in your second language, the government cannot systematically prevent you from accessing that, but that doesn't mean that the government has to provide access to education and language of choice to everyone. That would be a positive right, and that's not how, how it works in Canada. And it's the same with the right to housing. So we have adopted in legislation the right to housing. It is recognized uh, at the federal level that Canadians have a right to housing, but it's not like everyone all of a sudden is guaranteed a home. What it means is that the government will study and will remove barriers to people's ability to access housing equitably. The first, um, one of the first things that uh, was that the government did to implement the right to housing was to create this position of the federal housing advocate. Mary Jose Wool was appointed the federal housing advocate and has been studying what are the barriers to accessing the right to housing. And she's found that the financialization of housing is one of the key barriers. So that's the extraction of wealth from the housing system. That can be through mm -hmm. real estate investment trusts, buying up uh, buildings, evicting people and increasing the rent. That's where that rental protection fund is actually really seen as allowing nonprofits to compete with those financializing actors to rather than having them be bought by a REIT and increasing rent, it can be bought by a nonprofit um, and decreasing rent. Uh, and there's some work that um, 
that Airbnbs, especially Airbnbs that are not owned and operated by the owner, that this is another way of, again, extracting wealth from the housing system and taking housing out of even the private rental market and putting it into the short-term rental market, um, that this is a barrier to realizing the right to housing in Canada. So there's still, there's a lot more dimensions to it, but those are some of the first, uh, the first approaches that the federal advocate is taking. And it's really important to, for advocates to not um, stop with the advocacy because it, it, it needs to be implemented properly and fairly and just getting it into legislation isn't enough. The final thing is that that really does contrast with the approach in, in Wales, which is more of a positive right, the duty to assist. You do have a right to safe and secure housing and governments have a responsibility to actively help you access that. So that would be um, very different from the Canadian model, but a lot of countries are drawing inspiration from that because it does in some ways kind of seem to make sense that at some point someone's gotta be responsible, people have a right to housing, um, and there, there are governments that may be able to do something about it. That's really interesting. You talked about the the outside investors and the speculation that happens in the market. Um, we've seen in recent kind of years, governments saying that they're going to be doing something about that um, and that they're going to limit it or they're going to take, uh, you know, the amount of people that can buy up uh, properties. Is that is that response from the government just kind of skirting the actual issue? Or do you think that doing that is, is an important thing to also ensure that we have a, a good housing supply? So there's a there's a lot, of course, there's it's always you know both and or whatever, like mm -hmm. all of these different types of interventions. I mean, I didn't talk in BC that BC has implemented pretty aggressive regulations of Airbnb. So if you don't own or and essentially live in the um, live in the space, you cannot rent it out as an Airbnb. And there's been an influx of condos for sale for um, at more affordable rates um, because they can't be used to run Airbnbs. There's also been sort of the vacancy and speculation tax in BC that's been pretty well received. But again, those are some, some of those interventions are more concentrated in more of the middle income, middle part of the housing spectrum you know, area. Whereas uh, supportive housing, non-market housing, uh, non-profit housing actually requires more like upfront investment from governments. It's really mm -hmm. expensive to build. The capital cost is hugely expensive. Also, the operating cost long term is expensive. And that isn't just going to be, uh, you're not, we're not just going to get at that through kind of changing in a, in a tax code or, or changing, you know, even who can, who, how many of what people can own. That's really interesting. I think another thing that you brought up is is that change in the what's going on in the context of not just the policy itself, but around it. And I think one of the questions that uh, one of the things that often gets talked about is immigration. And what is the effect of immigration on on this in the last couple of years? There's been a lot of uh, you often even see different levels of government saying, oh, this is because we're we have so many new people coming into the country. This is what's really causing the, the housing crisis that we're seeing. Um, is that is that something that um, has a merit in terms of of what you've studied so far? Um, so I haven't. I mean, I've one of my my colleagues, Robert Schertzer, is he has done a lot of work on on immigration, and for a couple of years, we've always been talking about how we we should team up and and do a bit of a study on this because I think that I do think that the conversation is missing. Uh, well, I mean, in some cases, it can kind of turn into a bit of a uh, of a blame game as it it sometimes is helpful but sometimes isn't really helpful i mean i think that it, it really is a case of siloing of government decisions um there have been active decisions around immigration for very uh important reasons um the population in canada has grown uh in large part through immigration and that is uh, a key strength of of canada that is some that is a reason the economy is strong why the country is strong of course there's all kinds of problems everywhere but um, limiting immigration is, you know, not the only answer. There's another answer in terms of trying to match things up, again, trying to match policy up with where we are demographically, with who we are as a country. People who immigrate get visas. They're, you know, they go through a very, very rigorous process. Um, and it is, in some ways, it's kind of puzzling, the fact that we wouldn't have thought about, are there enough homes for all of these people? 
um, and thinking about setting people up for success. I think it's a very difficult pathway that a lot of people are facing right now. Um, and a lot of students too, a lot of them are students at the University of Toronto. And there's mm -hmm. something to be said for, for the situation being pretty unfair in some ways for there not being kind of the that housing piece to line up for once they're here, are there is there going to be a safe place for them to live? Great. Thank you so much, Professor. It's been such an interesting uh, conversation and uh, so many things to think about and probably more questions to be asked. And i uh, just uh, like to leave it at that. And on behalf of the University of Tor uh, Toronto Mississauga, I'd like to thank you for your presentation and your responses to the questions from our alumni audience. And uh, to our audience, uh, we've received a lot of questions today. We apologize if we weren't able to get to yours. It's such a rich topic. We can't uh, I think we've, it feels like we've just touched the surface of it, uh, but that, but that, but we have people who are professors who are studying this every day. So, so it does, it is a, uh, definitely a complex, uh, topic. Uh, when this, uh, webinar ends, uh, you'll have the option to take a, a post event survey, and we hope that you will take a couple minutes to complete it as your feedback is very helpful for us in planning future events. And everyone who registered for today's event will also receive a link to the recording in their inboxes in the coming days. Uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar, be sure to check out the up upcoming events listings and more on UTM alum uh, UTM's alumni page. And you'll see a link for more information pop up in the chat box now and will also be included in the post event survey details. So thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hosting you again at another U of T Mississauga alumni event. And thank you to Allison uh, and hope that everybody has a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's wonderful spending time with you. Thank you.